All right. Um, for those of you who may not know me, um, I'm Andrea Wilkins. I'm the legislative liaison with the State League. Um, again, filling in for Karen Sheik, who um, unfortunately um, is unavailable today, but uh, she will be catching up uh, via the recording and she and I will probably also um, have a follow-up as well. We are very excited to be joined uh, by Judge Hurt today. Um, to discuss strategies for addressing barriers to voting. Um, we all know that Colorado has got uh, great voter uh, participation rates, uh, but um, you know the league is always interested in figuring out ways that we can increase that even further. And we've been particularly concerned about special populations that might have um, unique barriers to voting, um, older adults, disabled people, um, you know, out-of-state college students, individuals that have been historically marginalized. There's a lot of unique challenges out there that different groups face. So over time, um, you know, we've been brainstorming some different ways that, you know, we might help address that issue. And um, Pre-Pick Posted was one of our initial thoughts, and that led me to have a conversation with Jed that resulted in this meeting here today. Um, Jed was able to provide a lot of great perspective on sort of the, um, you know, some of the considerations around prepaid postage and um, shared a lot of information that he uh, will share with you today on um, other strategies that may better accomplish what we're actually looking to do than prepaid postage. So um, we thought it was really important that you all hear from him so we can kind of figure out, um, you know, how we can uh, you know, play a role in addressing barriers to voting, either in combination with the secretary's office or, um, you know, perhaps perhaps outside of that as an individual effort. Um, but in any case, it's it's a very important issue to the league, and um, we're really excited to uh, to hear his presentation and comments. Uh, before I hand it over to Jed, though, um, I do want to check in with the group and see if anybody has got any updates or announcements or any discussion items that we should get to before we get into our presentation. All right, uh, hearing and seeing none. Um, one uh, one small update, I'm not sure that it really qualifies as an update. But, uh, one thing that I will mention, um, a recent conversation that I had had with um, some of the coalition members um, that were behind the um, RCB um, and presidential primary bills last year, which was unsuccessful. Um, we had been keeping an eye out to um, you know, kind of see if there was going to be a re-emerging effort. Um, the latest I had heard on that is that there's nothing in work at this point in time. Um, we do plan to keep in touch with the coalition. So if, um, you know, there are some developments there, um, that's definitely something we want to be involved in. I'm sure this group will want to be involved in that and as well as um, our LAC members focusing on election issues that um, are already on this call. Um, so we'll continue to communicate out, but, um, you know, welcome any uh, communications and updates from all of you as well. Celeste, I see you have a hand there. Please jump in. Um, you mentioned a coalition. What coalition is this? Um, well, coalition maybe is um, a little bit <laughs> of a strong word. <laughs> um, specifically, I was speaking with Jason, uh, um, who was part of uh, the team that was uh, that was working uh, on the development of last year's bill. And um, I think there's some talks about, um, you know, some further stakeholder discussions and um, uh, maybe some talks between um, specifically Jason and us. Um, so we'll kind of see where that lands, but I, I'm probably using coalition in, um, I, I should be using it in a looser way than, <laughs> than maybe I implied. Okay, thank you. I'm glad the league is, part of this effort. Um, yes. Yes. I guess I do have something else to report when you're done with that topic. Go ahead, Celeste. Okay. Um, I spoke to the League of Women Voters of Utah president uh, this past week, and uh, specifically about 
the multi-winner form of RCV that they use there. I had read their 2017 study. I think calling it a study is giving it too high a, a profile, too high a status, um, because in the end, they didn't have any consensus or anything. They've just gone with the national position. But uh, in that study, they talked about two forms of RCV, the single winner instant runoff voting and the multi-winner single transferable vote. And I asked the Utah League president if she knew that the kind of multi-winner RCV that they use in Utah is not the kind that was in their study. Um, and that it's a quite controversial form of RCV. Um, I, I argue that it's not very democratic because some people can get multiple votes and other people just get one vote, which is basically useless. She was surprised by this. She sent me to the, um, uh, the executive director of RCV Utah and I talked to her also. She told me a little bit about the history of why it got implemented. Um, I also explained to her the, the lack of equality in voting power. Um, and, and, she, and so we had a great discussion. And I don't know what's going to happen with their pilot program. It's due to expire in 2025. The Utah League argued to continue the study because there was a bill to cancel it. Um, they argued to continue the study to collect more data. And I'm personally in favor of always collecting data. Um, but uh, one thing I did ask the um, or tell the Utah state president is that a bunch of us in leagues around the nation are going to be very interested to see if at the end of this pilot project, which is the end of 2025, are they going to, con would they, con will they continue advocating for this, uh, I call it a bad form of multi-winner RCV, or will they go to the gold standard form of proportional RCV? So um, I put that bug in their, in their head, and I was so happy finally to get to talk to them because I've been trying to reach them for quite some time. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it is right now. Well, thank you for that update, Celeste. It sounds like that was a really important conversation. And um, I'm sure the group would love to hear what else comes of that and where they plan to head with it. I, I, I'm guessing you probably have uh, some follow-up conversations planned or plan to reach back out. Um. I said, let's let's keep talking. This is, uh, but there was uh, the thing that I else. The other thing I was going to say is is the follow up, and I don't remember what what it is, but maybe it'll come to me. Great, sounds good. Well, thank you for that, um, Neil. Go ahead. All right, thanks, and I really want to congratulate Celeste on. Uh, on everything having to do with Utah. I don't know if the world would understand what it was like uh, with that <laughs> method if she hadn't really continued to promote that and finally reached them. And uh, so that's really important. And it's it's the difference between one of the worst voting systems and one of the best voting systems. You know, I think it's worse than plurality, what they're doing now. And it could be exactly uh, what we're looking for. And my suggestion and, and question would be whether we can gather the cast vote records, the actual ballot data from elections in Utah and analyze how the results would be different under the different things. We've done this in an election in Maine and found exactly that um, it was, uh, I'll, I'll agree, anti-democratic the way that uh, it was done in one very unusual place in Maine that has already been fixed. So don't, <laughs> don't and, lean on And I Maine's would like it. to say that when I talked to the state league president, I pointed out, uh, and I think both the state league president, Kathleen, Catherine Beely, and the Utah RCV executive director, Kelleen Potter, I pointed out to both of them that uh, the Maine changed from their bad Utah version to the gold standard single transferable vert vote version. And Portland, Oregon, a big city has just adopted um, the single transferable vote. So there is 
people are aware of the issues and so yeah and so, come to our come to our, if you want to talk more about this come to the alternative voting methods task force meeting on monday evening. hopefully and this is an issue everywhere we can gather the data in utah and give them even more specific input thank you so much well thank you both and um very great plug for uh, uh the um alternative voting methods meetings last um Definitely want as many people joining in that as well. Um, all right. I know um, we're we're all very interested to hear um, what Judd has to share with us today. So I will do a quick introduction and hand it over. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Judd Choate. He is the Colorado State Election Director with the Colorado Department of State. This is a position that he has held since 2009. He served as the president of the National Association of State Election Directors in 2017 and was a founding member of the Governmental Coordinating Council, which was formed by the Department of Homeland Security following Russian interference in the 2016 election. He's a member of the Bipartisan Policy, Policy Center's Election Reform Task Force, serves on the Election Administration Research and Practice Editorial Board, and is a member of the Safeguarding Democracy Project, which was formed after January 6th in response to election misinformation and disinformation. Jed has a JD from the University of Colorado and a PhD in political science from Purdue University. And so with that, I would just ask everyone to welcome Jed. Hey everybody. Uh, oh, please, um, no applause necessary. Okay, um, so I, I have a slide deck which um, I will show to you. It's way too long and uh, somewhat off topic. So um, we should abandon it or go through it very quickly. Um, so let's see, how do I make this? This is always the trick. Okay, do you guys see the full slide? Um, it's okay. still on the... Um, Kind of that regular view version, not presentation mode. Yep. So let me do this one. How about now? There we go. Yep. Okay. I was. That's always. I got to always figure that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, basically a soup to nuts presentation I do on elections. Hopefully, it'll kind of generate some conversation. But I, I just to tell you, I'm gonna like race through these slides um, so that we have enough time for a conversation. Um, so uh, I kind of break these into pieces. First is about voter registration, who qualifies. You guys probably know this. The interesting thing on this one is um, the idea of a currently incarcerated felon. Our law is very narrow. Um, currently incarcerated felon is somebody who's literally behind bars. So other people in halfway houses or um, on work release, uh, do, they do not get restricted. And so they are eligible to vote. So that's why we have one of the more aggressive uh, ex-felon voter registration policies in the country, because that's the very narrow universe of people that can't register to vote. Here are the various ways we do registration. The big ones here are automatic voter registration and online voter registration. Uh, we do automatic voter registration. We register on the order of 10,000 people a month through automatic voter registration at the DMV. We also register people at um, online voter registration. So here is, um, these are old numbers, sorry, but I just didn't update them yet. 2021. Uh, we registered about 10,000 to 12,000 people a month through automatic voter registration. Uh, it's very consistent. You, uh, The reason why it sort of humps in the middle of the year is because of uh, that's when people move. So uh, we get more people moving in the summer. This is uh, voter registration uh, in a presidential year of using online voter registration. So you see that uh, there's an early hump around the presidential primary, then there's another hump around the state primary, and then there's a much larger hump around the general election. So these are uh, trends that we see in the use of online voter registration as opposed to 
AVR. AVR is very flat. It just happens as a natural function of our interaction with a voter. And then OLVR is completely voter driven. So we see, you know, event, uh, events lead to uh, more interaction. So here are, here's some of our current uh, or relatively current voter registration data. Our active voter registration numbers have pretty consistently gone up over the years uh, since 2014. Our inactive numbers are also pretty steady. Inactive means that we've tested that address and the person that is registered to vote at that address no longer lives there. Um, some people think, and this is especially the case among election deniers, that inactive voter registration is bad. It's actually really good. You want to have an inactive voter registration. That means you're testing addresses. If you had zero inactive voter uh, voters, then that would mean that you haven't done any work to try to clean your voter rolls. This is the change in party over the uh, past decade or so. You can see that there's been an incredible increase in the number of people who are unaffiliated and uh, simultaneously a decrease in the number of people who are Republican. The uh, Democratic numbers are, have remained relatively steady. They're also in decline, but not nearly as precipitous as the Republican decline. This again is a point of conversation when I find myself on the phone with a person who believes that elections are being stolen. I point out that uh, the problem in their eyes is probably the decline in the number of people who uh, consider themselves to be Republican. And that has nothing to do with the way the election is conducted. It's about who is voting ballots. Colorado's voter registration rate compared to the country, uh, we are fourth. So if you look at the bar underneath the map, you'll see that if I were to hover, this is not an accurate site, but if I were to hover, we would be the fourth bar there. We are at 92.4% um, eligible registered voters who are registered. Um, so we're really light. That light means we are highly registered. The states that are above us are the states, uh, well, DC is number one and DC is in the state, so they don't qualify. So we're actually third. And then the, uh, the other ones are uh, New Jersey and Maryland. Uh, I have some qualms about the data but you know, being third is pretty good. So we're at 92 point, oh, essentially 92 and a half percent registered to vote. So that means we are no longer a state that has low hanging fruit. We are now a state that's way up in the tree. So if we are trying to drive up the number of people who register to vote uh, from 92.5, uh, that means you have to have really aggressive policies. You have to have very targeted efforts um, and frankly, those are the toughest people to catch. By the way, if you have any questions along the way, just jump in. I'm just roaring through these. Um, let's get that. The Is Oklahoma so bad because of the Native Americans? Yeah, Oklahoma is very bad because of the uh, percentage of Native American population in the state. Uh, but they're just bad, period. In a lot of the darker blue states, uh, are states that do not prioritize election, uh, elections and then do not uh, prioritize voter registration. And in fact, consider voter registration to be uh, something that government should have no role in and that it should be entirely driven by um, a person's willingness to make the effort to become registered. I am on the opposite end of that perspective and believe that government should be, uh, should treat their constituents like customers and actively seek to help them to do the things that make government more effective. And so that's one of the reasons why, well, not just me, but that's uh, that attitude in Colorado is one of the reasons why our numbers are so high. Um, let's see, election. So the way an election works in Colorado is basically we are the first big moment of an election is the 45 day mailing deadline for military and overseas voters, we call those UOCAVAs. Um, and for those of you that um, are tracking the calendar, that's three days from now. So the 45 day mailing deadline for ballots for this fall election is three days from, from today. 
Uh, we are a mail ballot state, so we deliver ballots to all uh, active registered voters. We don't send them to inactive voters because we know that our voters don't live there. So um, we only send to actives. Um, we send at 22 days. By the way, there's a good law for you. Um, Colorado and Oregon have the two uh, narrowest gaps of time between the, the date in which we have to mail our ballots and election day. Um, uh, Oregon, I believe, is 18 days, and we are 22 days. So if uh, if we were to make a good change to law, I would encourage us to mandatory uh, push that back to 29 days or even 25 days to give our voters an extra week of seeing those ballots, having those ballots, being able to do something with those ballots. For most For most Coloradans, that doesn't really help us all that much. But there are voters like Native American voters who, who see a delay in mail processing um, or rural voters uh, who, you know, by the time they get the ballot, they get it three days later than the rest of the state. And then if they return it by mail, they're losing three days on the way back. So um, if that's, you know, if we were going to pass a law that really helped in mail ballot, that would be a great one. Uh, we have drop boxes in the state. We're over 400 now. This is an example of the numbers of drop boxes per county in the metro and other large counties. Uh, some of these are over 40 now. Denver has over 40. El Paso has over 40. But we run at about one for every 11,000 active registered voters. Uh, we also do ballot tracking. In 2020, 52% uh, of our population tracked their ballot in 2022, it was 50%. We automatically sign people up if we have an email address for you. So um, if you have an email address on your voter record, we sign up that email address, whether you wanted it or not. And some people hate it. They write us and they call us all sorts of names and we don't care. We sign you up because we think you should have that information. If you don't want it, that's fine. All you got to do is remove your name from the list. Uh, here are some, uh, some data on uh, ballot tracking. You can see that uh, we sort of peak at that younger age. Um, sort of makes sense if you think about it. Unaffiliated are the higher percentage of people that receive these notices. But honestly, these numbers pretty much track our overall voter reg. So, um, you know, we're at about what we would anticipate, uh, even if you remove age, remove party ID. Uh, we verify uh, voter reg, or we ver verify our ballots by uh, doing signature verification. We are just, uh, if you're interested, uh, we're being sued right now by Vets Voice, which is an organization that is, uh, you know, purportedly out to support uh, veterans. Really, they're, they're sort of a shell that was created by a law firm to, as the basis to sue us, which is fine. Everybody does that, but um, but they don't. I mean, they don't have a long history of supporting um, veterans. What they are, though, is trying to eliminate the verification of mail ballots uh, through signatures. They believe that that's discriminatory. So, um, so that's what the lawsuit is about. The lawsuit is to Leo, stop barking. Leo, stop. Sorry, that's my dog, Leo. Anybody that walks by gets part of um, So they're suing us uh, to try to eliminate uh, signature verification, lim eliminate signatures being used as the basis to um, accept a ballot. Uh, if you were thinking, hey, how many ballots are rejected and why? This is the universe of rejection from 2020. 99.21% of ballots that we received were counted. 0.79% were rejected, and the largest percentage of those were signature discrepant. So uh, two thirds of the two thirds of one percent were rejected because of signature discrepancy. Some were missing an ID. Those are people that managed to get registered to vote without providing enough information for us to fully know what their identity is, and then people who just are missing a signature in their file. So these are. Uh, folks that or ballots that we had to reject. And so here I'm going to show you this slide. The slide like just hurts my soul, but um, you 
can see what we're sort of up against when it comes to signature verification. So these are the percentage of ballots rejected by age. So this was 2020. You can see younger voters, their ballots are rejected at substantially higher percentage than all other voters. And uh, if you're thinking, gosh, what happened in 2020 that made this uh, such a terrible number? Well, here's 2018. There's 2020. There's 2018. It's the same phenomenon. We, we see this phenomenon in every election, and it's the younger voters either don't have a signature on file or they have one signature on file, and it's the one that they did on the pad at a DMV. And that signature is hard to compare to a signature on the back of an envelope. And then young people's signatures evolve over time. And so uh, we'll have a signature that they gave us at 16, but now they're voting at 19. And that signature has changed quite a bit. We just can't verify it. So that's why we're rejecting a lot of young people's signatures. You can see that if you're 72 or 71, it's a really low percentage of people that we're rejecting at that age. Um, as you get older, that number goes back up. Yes, Kay. I have a question. Uh, I hear this in other places, not necessarily in Colorado, about you know people being rejected because their signature wasn't what it was when they were 17 years old. How can we as um, league members help people understand that it isn't the older people that this is happening to, and that isn't an example in our state? Yeah, so uh, what? What here? here's the way target signatures work. So um, you, you as, let's say you're a county official. You're a county official, and every single time you process a ballot and accept the ballot signature, that signature then replaces the old target signature. So the most recent signature that was accepted by your county is the new target signature. So when I see Kay Shaw's new ballot come in, that signature is being compared against the last signature we received. So we're not we're not um, throwing out a bunch of people because they're comparing the old signatures. The problem is the young voters who perhaps don't vote very consistently or they're and their signature is moving over time. It's changing a lot. And, and then there are people, and this is just wacko, I got to tell you, but there are people who every five years decide to change their signature. You know, and you're just like, what on earth are you thinking? But they, but they do that, and that causes some problems too. But for the most part, it's about young people either not having the signature, only having one, likely done on a pad, uh, like a King Supers, right? And uh, and then their signatures change. Neil. Thanks. And this is great data. So uh, it might be helpful to frame this data. And, and I don't know if you have this data or could could generate it by, you know, like how many elections some people have voted in. Because oh, yeah. based on what you've said, that it would clarify that in a way that that gets across and, you know, kind of assure people that once they've voted in one election, you get a good signature on file that's actually the kind of signature that people use when they're voting, and that's going to compare really well. Do you have that kind of data? We absolutely do. I don't have it in the slide deck, but um, the percentage likelihood of having your signature rejected goes down precipitously by the number of signatures we have on file for that voter. So the people with zero signatures they're rejected at like 50% because they, when, when they submit their ballot, we can't accept it and they have to go through cure. And so then they have to do, a, they have to actively cure. And then if you have one signature, it's like down to 10% or 7% or so. And then if you have two, it's down to 1%. If you have four or nine or 20, then it's way down infinitesimal. So it's all about how many signatures, how consistently you do this, how comfortable you are with election materials, you know, that that create. Can you gather data. these signatures uh, up front by sending out postcards or something like that? So this is an ongoing policy that we are working with counties on. There are counties that currently right now send out uh, letters to people that don't have signatures on file or only have one saying, please provide us a second signature. Denver does that. Um, there are, I think Arapaho also does that. We um, 
toyed around with making that a rule, you know, requiring counties to do that. Um, I think it would be better in a law. So uh, because we're that's an expense, we always hate to put things in rules that are going to require money. And this is a, definitely a, a money expense. So, uh, but yeah, that's a great example of something the county could do because they know they can see in their database how many people, and it's easy, it's an easy query to run to see how many people are uh, down to zero signatures or only one, and then write a letter to them. So absolutely, that's a great idea and something where the works of doing. All right, so polling centers, uh, what we call VSPCs in Colorado, uh, they are in a general election, they're required to be open 15 days prior, uh, normal hours, we, uh, in the law, we set up a criteria of these are the kinds of things that you should think about as a county about where you're putting your polling places. And we have, you should all, if you're in front of a computer right now, and you can open up another screen, you should put into your screen, you should say, vote center citing tool, vote center citing tool. If you put those in right now and you uh, did a Google search, you would find this program that we use. And by the way, you would find them in other states too, but a program that we uh, worked with the University of Southern California to create. And it's just such a fantastic program. Uh, it helps counties to decide where, where do I have gaps? Where do I need a drop box? Where, do, where should I be putting a polling place? And it breaks down into great data for um, the counties to sort of churn and burn on how to use that. So definitely look, look that up if you have never looked at it. How many polling places do we need? Well, here are the criteria that are set in state law. Uh, basically, it's um, uh, based on the size of your county, how many people are in your county, and then what day you are uh, in front of an election. If you're talking about election day, it's one for every 10,000 for counties that are uh, uh, pretty small, and then one for every uh, 12,500 for the larger counties. Uh, so when you vote in person, uh, first of all, like how are people voting when they vote in person? Well, um, the voting in, so this, in this election in 2020, about 6% of our population voted in person. And of those, a majority, not a large majority, but a majority voted a paper ballot in person. And then a minority, 42% voted a ballot marking device. So if you do the math, that means a ballot marking devices, which are the screens, were less than 3% of votes cast in the 2020 election, more like about 2.5%. And, a half and uh, activity we see at a VSPC by day, this is statewide by day um, in the 2020 election. You can see that um, our numbers increased the Friday before election day with a little bump. Then Saturday went back down. Monday and Tuesday it really skyrocketed, and so um, you, uh, we had ninety thousand total transactions on election day in the twenty twenty election. Um, and then we break it down if you can break it into those categories. And people always wonder, well, how many people are registering? You know, new, uh, uh, you know, doing same day registration. It's actually a very small number of people, even across all fifteen of these days there were only 22,000 people in a presidential election. So uh, folks that believe that uh, same-day registration is a path to uh, you know, election malfeasance, there, there's just not enough people. We're not talking about enough people to be able to do that. Uh, watchers, you all could be watchers if you want to. Uh, there's a whole process to do that. And, uh, there's easily explained in the law. Uh, which I could direct you to if you're interested. Uh, post election day, so on election day, we're back doing... to watchers. Um, yeah. okay. It's hard to be. It's much harder for an unaffiliated voter to become a watcher because you need approval, either from a candidate or uh, an issue committee. Yes. Uh, how can we get that fixed? Since the the largest segment of voters are unaffiliated. Uh, and great point. Uh, but you you describe the universe of people that you need to go to as an unaffiliated. You need to go to a candidate that's not a party candidate. 
uh, and or you need to go to a um, uh, an initiative on the ballot. Uh, there was a bill this past session that we tried to get amended. The League of Women Voters lobbyists tried to get amended so that um, more watchers could be unaffiliated, but we were not successful. The other side to that is not just watchers, but um, election judges. We don't really have, the counties don't have a lot of flexibility on using unaffiliated people as election judges. They, the, the law, in so many ways, the law sort of prescribes that they must be uh, Democrats and Republicans because they set up this, Democrats and Republicans do everything together, right? So uh, they are basically uh, protecting the system by always being paired. And so uh, because of that, there's not a lot of flexibility for unaffiliated. That would be a great change in the law. And I tell you what, the counties would love you for that because more and more it's difficult to find election judges because uh, we're almost to the point where 50% of the population, the registered voter population is unaffiliated. And I'll note that's especially uh, relevant to uh, nonpartisan contests like city councils. So it's crazy to have the only people you know, the split and the only people allowed to to do that um, uh, election judging, uh, well, for, for a lot of different offices to be yeah. less for unaffiliated when the whole contest has nothing to do with, well, nothing I'll say to do with politics. Uh, things we do after election day. So, um, uh, you, because you're sophisticated actors, will not be surprised by this, but lots of people are, that um, guess what? We get a whole bunch of ballots on election day, and all the people that would be processing those ballots are working at polling places. So that night, we cannot post uh, our totals. I mean, we the idea that we would have 100% of that work done on election night or even the next day is just preposterous. Uh, so we're working those ballots a day, two days, three days after election day, uh, because so many ballots come in on election day. Now, in mail ballot, you would think that we would get a lot of those ballots early, and we do. It's just that, you know, 30% come in on election day. And 30% in a, an election of 3 million means a million ballots are coming in on election day. And you just can't do it. You can't process it. Uh, there's also an eight-day cure period in an eight day window of time where UACABA ballots can come in. These are military and overseas ballots that were postmarked uh, by election day. We also do risk limiting auditing and we uh, are working on the canvas. Uh, so all of that stuff is happening the week after the election. Uh, this is a risk limiting audit. He'll tell you all about that. And then we do the canvas uh, and then recounts. So we have uh, both mandatory and voluntary recounts. Um, that law changed last year. So Andrea will, Andrea will remember that. Um, so here's some data from uh, other uh, Colorado, sort of putting Colorado in context with the rest of the country. Uh, if anybody ever tells you that nobody uh, votes in the US and that it's, you know, democracy is declining, they are so very wrong, and you should point them to the data. In fact, in 2020, our turnout was the highest of any election since 1900. So 120 years of elections, and we had the highest turnout percentage-wise. Uh, and if you think about like the universe of people who are eligible now, is much more diverse than uh, were, diver were eligible in, in 1900. So actually, our participation in democracy is very much trending upward and is uh, very high compared to the world we used to live in. Uh, Maude, it looks like you have a question. Thanks, Jed. Um, and thank you for being here and, and speaking. Um, there, there are a couple of questions in chat. Um, oh, no, I can't see the chat. Oh, oh okay. Um, one is to please show the risk limiting audit slide again. Oh, okay. I can go back. Um, and, um, one, I, I would I just had a comment. Arapaho County, at least when I worked 2020, has three colors of uh, election. Yep. 
Oh, we lost you, Bob. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, three colors of lanyards for election judges, red for Republican, blue for Democrat, and black for everybody else. And yep. um, as long as they've got two different colored lanyards at a table, they're good to go. La, 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 la. <laughs> they're not supposed to do that. <laughs> They're supposed to have red, reds, and and uh, blues. That's uh, what about what about minority parties? So the they are not per permitted to. There are uh, 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 specific functions in law that require a Democrat and a Republican. The um, uh, processing of signature verification, the processing of uh, uh, running ballots on a tabulator. Those have to be done by Democrats and Republicans working together, period. That's just the, the law is very clear. Now, if you're if you're slicing open an envelope and taking it out and putting it on a stack, and that can be done by third parties or by a third Okay. Party. Okay, the, yeah, that's that that was that was the area that I was working in. So okay. so we were we were pulling, we were doing the the highly skilled work of pulling envelope ballots out of envelopes and flattening them out and mindless work of processing them. And 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 putting the ones with soups spilled on them on the top. That's, that's right. Um and someone else so someone asked for the risk limiting audit slide. Yep, I to put go, that up. To go up. And then someone else asked what is the frequency of late received ballots? Oh okay, yeah. So um that's a great point. And actually, I was definitely going to try to get to that because uh, I know that's your question. So uh, in the 2020, I don't have a slide on this, but in 2020, we had, I believe, like 6,500 6, ballots or so that were received after the deadline. It could not be counted. As a point of comparison, Washington State had 11,000 ballots that were received after the deadline. It could not be counted. Washington State accepts postmarks. We do not accept postmarks. We had a smaller universe of ballots that could not be accepted after the deadline. The reason why we believe, and I know it's sort of counterintuitive, is if you tell everybody over and over and you pound it into them, an election official must have it in their hands by 7 p.m., you run far, uh, far smaller risk of losing some of those votes because they're arriving too late. However, when you have a regime that says, all you got to do is get it in to a mailbox by 7 p.m., then people will run that all the way to the deadline, and then you're relying on the United States Postal Service. And, you know, frankly, that's not where I want to put my eggs. So, so that was that was my question. Um, and I'm just trying to understand your analysis for just a moment, if I could. So yeah. um, I think... I think I understand you as saying that there is um, a lower likelihood of late received ballots in states where the um, received by date uh, is different than the postmark date. And I wasn't quite sure what you were saying was less we likely. We don't allow postmarks, period. Say and that so again? Colorado does not allow postmarks. Uh, yes, I understand that. So the and the point is that um, Colorado, and I'm just I'm just reporting data. Colorado receives fewer ballots after the the deadline that cannot be counted because they were received late than than states and jurisdictions which permit postmarks. And, and, and the you reason why that out. is because because people mail them. And then we are reliant on the United States Postal Service. And frankly, then they mail them after election day. So, you know, whatever deadline you give somebody, they're gonna go, they're gonna work right up to that deadline. And uh, and really, I mean, there's two two things that are happening here. One is we want to count as many ballots as we possibly can. And and obviously one part of that is getting them by election day, and that's our preferred method. And then secondly, uh, we want to be able to post our results as fast as we can on election night and have some faith that what we're posting is going to be the, the outcome. And if we, if we set a window of time in which we permitted postmarks, we would be like Washington State and not have 50% of our ballots on election night. 
when uh, in Colorado, we have 100% of our ballots on election. So I think the numbers were 6,500 versus 11,000. And is That's that right. your analysis balanced out by the idea that there are many more voters in Washington state than there are in Colorado? There are not many more voters in Washington state. I thought it was a couple, I thought it was a million more. No, it's about 700,000. But if you okay. were, it's twice as many. So we're, Got it. Got we it. are rejecting. So they would have to have twice as many voters as us for those two numbers to be equal. I understand better now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, more data. Yeah. So I ask a couple risk limiting audit questions. Oh, absolutely. Neil, you're back in risk limiting audit. Well, I have a question on about postmarks first. Um, yeah, so, it, I thought so, that postmarks were allowed for UOCAVA ballots. We we permit them only for UOCAVA ballots, which okay, is about 30,000 30, ballots a, a year. Thank you. During an election, yeah. And that's a specific carve out in the law. So let me, can I just go through a couple more slides? Because I only have a couple more left. And then, okay. um, so uh, Colorado had the second highest turnout in the 2020 general at 76.4. Minnesota had the highest. By the way, actually, they did a recalculation of that. It's actually over 77%, but still second. Um, this is how Colorado trends compared to national. So you can see that we are typically around 10% higher than the national average when it comes to turnout. Um, and that's, you know, since 20, since 2000. This is Colorado compared to those the, the states that typically have the highest turnout. And we were second there for two elections in a row. Then this last one, we were fourth. Um, what kind of policies lead to high turnout? Well, same day registration and a mail ballot. Those are the two things that lead to high turnout. And you can see that the uh, eight out of 10 of the states that had the highest turnout in 2020 were same day, five of them were uh, mail ballot, all mail ballot, like literally every voter got a mail ballot. This is mail ballot usage nationally. Uh, most of them are on the western side of the U.S., and then a couple of stragglers on the eastern side. Uh, this is, again, if you like, look at 75% turnout, the majority of those are mail ballot states, so those are the ones that are at the top of that screen. How about if we go to the other side? What are the kinds of things that lead to low turnout? They are a voter registration deadline that's four weeks out from an election, so no same-day registration and then requiring an excuse to get a mail ballot. Those are the two things that lead to your lowest turnouts. And if you have favorite states that you're interested in, this is the um, 2020 general election turnout by state. So when uh, people say the Georgia turnout was crazy in 2020, uh, that's you know, an indication of fraud. They had the 26th highest turnout in Georgia in 2020. So that's uh, that's absolutely not the case. Nevada, also another one they like to talk about. Nevada's was under the median. Uh, Arizona's was uh, slightly higher. I don't see them on here. But, uh, or yeah, they were slightly below uh, Georgia. So these states where they were convinced that there were problems uh, actually were low-performing states generally. All right, so I'll stop talking so that we can answer questions. You guys have any questions for me? Happy to go back to that topic, by the way, the, the uh, mail ballot delivery. Yeah, well, I, I mean, if if others want to follow on those other things, that's great. Otherwise, I have some um, some ideas. For I think Celeste has her hand up, so yeah. we should probably start with Celeste. I, uh... I thought that you were going to talk about um, postage paid envelopes. Or... Yes. So postage paid. So this is a really good question. So um, right now we receive 80%. It's actually in the last, in 2022, we received 82% of our ballots returned by Dropbox. So uh, that means 18% came back through the United States Postal Service. Um, 
the the problem with prepaid postage is then you are incentivizing people to return their ballots through the United States Postal Service. And uh, just to go back to our earlier conversation, that means we are encouraging people to take the very slowest possible route to get that ballot done. I would I would interrupt just to say, I think what we're doing is removing the last barrier to people who are finding the amount of money to buy the next box of macaroni and cheese to feed the kids. So that's another perspective on sure. what is possible that we are doing to individuals who are at the lower end of the economic spectrum and you can't buy a single stamp of, at the Walmart. Right. And that's why we would encourage them to use a Dropbox. And that's why we have 400. These are individuals who, these are individuals who don't have gas money. They ride the local bus system. I, and I totally sympathize. The problem, though, is that if we put prepaid postage, they're going to put that ballot in the mail. And that and frankly, because they live in a poor part of the jurisdiction in which they live, chances are very good that their ballot's gonna be somewhat delayed because that's the way the United States Postal Service works. And then uh, we're gonna get that ballot after election day, we're not gonna be able to count. I, I would just argue that it's the responsibility of the voter to get it in their mailbox at a timely rate. And do you know about what happened in North Carolina 9th Congressional District and the ballot harvesting that we are now subject to? Absolutely, I'm totally familiar with that. <laughs> it's a very, it was a big deal in election system. Um, and that, by the way, did not change our laws regarding uh, transport of multiple ballots at all. Our, our law remains the same. You well, you can go and pick up uh, and bring in 10 ballots uh, uh, in addition to your own. But, but you're misanalyzing what happened in North Carolina. What happened is that someone didn't turn in ballots. They threw them in the trash can. And that election had to be overturned and at great cost. Ha redone. So Colorado is subject to that kind of malfeasance, given that we don't pay, give voters paid posted return envelopes. Well, I guess, I, I guess we are just going to have to agree to disagree. I, I don't, I don't think the, the, the way that North, that North Carolina example happened was because bad people went and knocked on doors and convinced people to give up their ballots. That's, Correct. That's how that's how ballots. That's how that that's how works. ballot happens in Colorado, in my opinion, is subject to that at this point in time. Well, I don't think putting right. postage. Well, right. it's just to finish the point. Has, but it's just to finish. Pretty, just to I don't finish think the putting, point. Putting return uh, postage on those envelopes would have zero effect on whether or not somebody comes and knocks on your door two weeks out from the election and asks for your ballot. Well, I, I don't think I would ever give my ballot to someone if I could just put it in my mailbox. Rich, That's so Rich, much easier. I'll let it go Rich, with that. Rich, go I ahead. think that if you put your ballot in a mailbox in Colorado, it does get delivered to the county clerk. So uh, totally it, true. The, the thing is that we don't advertise it, but but in, in effect, so maybe we should be advertising it more. I, I would love to see prepaid postage for people who don't live in Colorado, like they're away at college or whatever. They do live in the United States and, you know, other states do this, but Colorado doesn't. And, and Colorado doesn't look as good in my daughter's eyes when it comes to this issue. And I don't know if we can just do it for out of state people and then advertise that in state is also taken care of, but out of state is not paid for, right? I, uh, no, it's not. Um, I, okay. it, it is out of country. If you're, if, if you're out of right, or if you're out of state as a member of the military. So um, the two exceptions are um, out of state or as a member of the military, or out of country um, for uh, a Yukawa voter. So the um, and by the way, I don't know. I, I think I'm only aware of two states that pay for return postage. There may be others. No, you're wrong. But... Colorado, Oregon, not Colorado, but Oregon, California, and Washington all do. They passed it. It's very interesting backstory as to how they, you're shaking your head. Am I wrong in some state? Yes, you are. Well, California, California does not have a universal policy. It's done by the counties. 
um, I can uh, know five Cal five counties in California passed it before Jerry Brown signed it on his last day in office. Again, it, it permits the counties to do it. It doesn't. It's not a statewide policy. But it's, I'll, I'll it's have right. to check on that. That's very interesting. You may be accurate, and I've been misquoting what's happening in California, which explains some of the California return data. I, I want to jump in real quick to just point out that we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately. Um, and I want to be uh, respectful of Jed's time and everyone else. Um, Jed, one thing that you had mentioned um, when you and I talked individually that I thought was a really important consideration and kind of balancing all the factors was the potential number of voters to be gained versus with, when you have prepaid uh, posted versus those versus those that we might lose as a result of late return and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, could you say a little bit about that? Well, of course, it's an unknown. It's hard to, to know what what people could be, who could be voting, who's not. Uh, but uh, so I think that this requires sort of a holistic view of the way our elections work. If you are in a healthcare facility in the state of Colorado, we have healthcare facility uh, voting policies that require every county to go to a healthcare facility and make sure that you got a chance to vote. If you are in a jail, uh, every county is required to go to a jail and uh, provide an opportunity to register and to get a ballot and to vote that ballot. So um, a lot of the people that where we assume that there might be a problem, we do have ways of covering them. Now, do we have something for people who are homebound? Not really. Um, and if we were going to do something for somebody who was home, homebound, uh, that might be an interesting policy. But making prepaid postage available for all voters would do what happened in Washington, which was take uh, a group that was only 20%. They were getting 20% of their ballots back uh, by um, USPS. And then suddenly when they introduced prepaid postage, they were getting over 50% of their ballots back by uh, uh, postage by USPS. And we don't want to do that. We do not want to rely on the United States Postal Service. We we send ballots by the United States Postal Service. We do not want to rely on them returning them. Oh, just my opinion. Even though there's such a low percentage of late returned ballots, there's a that's a tiny number. And it's lower in Colorado than it is in states where there are um prepaid postage uh, it doesn't make the argument doesn't make sense to me in that respect i think it, i think you just made my argument that's that's the whole point is that we don't we want to and over time we've driven that number down and we want to drive that number down by providing lots of different opportunities to return so for instance we have 415 drop boxes in the state. We also have 366 polling places in the state for a normal general election. So that means there's almost 800 places where a person could physically drop a ballot off if they you know, wanted to do that. Um, and, that's, and by giving that many opportunities, we are reducing the need for a return by USPS. There are still people that do it, especially in rural areas, um, and I think you're right that there are people who are homebound who are really not in a position to do that. Um, and that's why organizations like yours and others uh, set up ballot retrieval operations where they reach out to those voters and say, hey, I will swing by your house and pick up your ballot for you. Uh, it's not ballot harvesting, even though I know it has sort of the same elements, but that's one of the things that a lot of the nonprofit groups have really been able to buttress in our state system. So most of your data has to do with national elections. And the little bit of data that I've been able to find out of Washington state, a very small little study where they gave half of a county, um, not a county, but election district, um, uh, prepaid and the other half not prepaid. It was giant increases in local elections. Are, are you aware of that? Or are you aware of any other data that does or doesn't support prepaid postage as increasing voter turnout in these off year, odd month kind of elections? 
Uh, well, so I'll go to what Barbara is saying in the chat, which is, um, I think local elections should be on the November ballot, in which case they're not local elections anymore. Now they're state elections, and uh, we would address it through that. Um, I, you know, I, I think you and I um, very much are trying to achieve the same end. I mean, we totally agree that uh, we're trying to get uh, as many people to register and get a ballot and vote that ballot. Um, and I'm sure that there are, if we sort of got into the nuts and bolts, there are probably ways to achieve what you're trying to achieve while simultaneously protecting the kinds of things that I'm worried about. Um, but you're not answering the question, which was, are you aware of any data about local elections? So um, what I will say is that I feel hundreds of phone calls every year about this and disinformation about our elections. And one of the things that people really fixate on is knowing who won the election on election night. We can post 70% of our election returns on election night. At 7 p.m., all the counties submit. We post those results, and by 7.30, you pretty much know how elections are, you know, who's won elections in the state of Colorado. Other states that allow for postmarks cannot do that. And that is something we must protect. Otherwise, the whole idea of our democratic model is at risk because people stop believing in the outcome of, of elections because there's this gap in time where misinformation drives how people believe that election win. And so uh, I'm against prepaid postage because prepaid postage leads to an extended period of time to return that ballot. So it leads you have some to data on, to tell us. Go on, go on, I'll let it go. I just don't agree. Um, sorry, Rich, I'm going to have to jump in and interrupt. I know there's a no lot of discussion that um, could continue on here, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time, and we're already over our um, our stopping point. Um, Neil, I know you have a hand up. Um, Judd, if you are amenable to, and you've been waiting for a while, if you're amenable maybe to a quick question, but then I think we probably need to call it to a close. Yeah, what do you got for me, Neil? <laughs> Um, I, can, will the Secretary of State's office publish the uh, commit to the manifests and the cash vote records before the audit? That's been slipping in recent years. Um, and will you invite the public to the random draw or um, or have people, will there be a public random in-person in drawing as opposed to the the video that doesn't really show that it's happening in real time? Yeah, I think the the um, we've removed the public element of that because of COVID, and I I don't know um, I don't have an explanation as to why we didn't do it in twenty two, um, probably conflicting schedules honestly, but I but um, yes, that is definitely something that we plan to go back to public. And uh, then um, we really need to fix how we select contests for the audit. If the Secretary of State's office could release data on um, all the data that you're using to do your picks to the public, you know, a day or two, you know, whenever you get it, release it to the public so we can weigh in and say, yeah, but everybody really wants this contest audited and and avoiding the, the current kind of fake audits. I, I don't want to be rude, but I mean, they are. That there are places where we do an audit of a Senate contest only for the county, you know, for Lam for Lamar County or something, and they actually had a different winner in Lamar County, and so an escalation would go in the wrong direction. Well, we should talk about that because I think you mean Baca County, which is where Lamar is. But um, I would, I so yes, um, I know that this is something that people really turn about, but keep in mind or anybody that's interested in audits. We pick a target race for an audit. All the target race does is tell us how many ballots we're going to pick. It doesn't tell us anything else. We're, we're going to look at every single contest on that ballot. And, we're, and the judges are going to do, they're going to input every single race on that ballot. So just because the target race that you would have chosen is not selected doesn't mean that it's not getting reviewed. The audit reviews everything on the ballot. And we keep track of whether there are problems in other races. And if we see that there are problems in other races, 
we tell the counties to go back and start over. They got to go back and pull more ballots. So this is, we take this stuff very seriously. And yes, it's true that there is a bit of like mystery around how a target race is selected, but ultimately the target race makes zero difference. It's only, the only difference that it makes is the number of ballots. And, um, you know, if we randomly picked it, chances are we would pick races that only had one or two ballots that would be reviewed. Or yeah. we would pick one that was so close that we had to do a hand count of the entire race. So by us using our criteria to select it, uh, we can get a lot closer to like a reasonable number of ballots in a particular audit. Well, I appreciate that. And, and we should talk some more because that's not the way the software used to work. Maybe you fixed it. But anyway, appreciate all you're doing. Colorado is a leader in risk limiting auditing. Uh, and so, uh, but there's there's definitely some things to to address some of the problems. So thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. And, and I by ask, the way, can, oh, can, I add, can I answer Barbara's thing? Uh, so she, sure. she says, let me see. Oh, yes. You can process... Uh, ballots, and we do process ballots starting 15 days prior to the election. So at 15 days, we can process, and we can start to count at eight days. So we we tabulate at eight days. We don't know who's winning, right? Nobody looks at the numbers, but we can tabulate at eight days. The problem is that 30% of our ballots come in on election. And so we only have what we have, you know, in our back pocket by the time we're processing. But there are some counties uh, that, you know, on election night, they, they can post 85, 90, 95% of their total because they don't have a lot of ballots and they can really churn through them. Um, and that's great, uh, as opposed to these states that are that are little laggards um, and uh, get really beat up for that. Arizona, uh, Washington, California, uh, North Carolina all got really beat up in 20 and 22 because they were so slow with their um, outcomes. So anyway, um, I think I got through a lot of those, didn't I? Uh, I, I, think you, I think you hit on most of everything that was in the chat. We really appreciate you staying a few minutes extra and we hope you'll join us again. <laughs> I know that there's a lot more conversation that could happen. Back. Invite me back anytime, I'm happy to talk. And by the way, we could do a whole one on risk limiting audits or we could do a whole one on mail ballots. I mean, um, so definitely do that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Jed, will we be able to share your slides? Is it? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, I'll send them to you and you can circulate. Sounds great. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Have a great afternoon. Bye.